All right, well, um, thank you all for joining and for everybody on the live stream. It's uh, wonderful to be here. Stockholm and Sweden has a big place in my heart, which I'll be talking a little bit about in the presentation. Uh, one of the three topics is with Raoul Wallenberg, and, and uh, I'm the president of the investigation into the fate, and uh, he is here. Uh, he was born, raised, the Wallenberg family is uh, fairly famous. If you were here yesterday, Marcus Wallenberg himself was one of the keynoters. And usually when I travel around the world, very few people have heard of Wallenberg. Um, and I ask for a show of hands and very few people, but I'd love to do it just once. If uh, anyone here has heard of the Wallenberg, hopefully everybody who was here yesterday. And that, that's wonderful to see. Um, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about it, but I'm going to attempt in the next uh, 20 minutes to have three separate stories, one on Rao Wallenberg and another on Moneyball, which is sports analytics and how that is a great example of how the uh, world has changed through data and AI. And then the next is data lake houses, which is the, one of the current revolutions in the field of data and AI and take you along that journey with me. So it's been a big honor to have worked in sports analytics for many, many decades. I, um, I'm known also a little bit for that movie Moneyball, which is a great example of how data has changed in industry, and really it's the culture around it, which we're seeing here in all of our industries. In some industries, there's been resistance to change, and as I talk to people, there still is in some degrees. And on the other hand, especially in the last couple of months, large language models and so on, the whole dialogue has been a big shift from what is AI to maybe we should dip our toe into it to now we're seeing full on of what is it, how can I implement it, and large language models is just one of many instances where the whole world and every aspect is changing. So here's a little diagram about uh, different aspects of my life. Now, one of the, the, the big achievements as part of the team was creating, after the movie Moneyball came out, got some visibility, uh, was uh, brought on to the Chicago Cubs to create and lead their analytics department to evaluate players, to evaluate trades. And on the top left, that's them. Uh, winning the World Series for the first time in 108 years. Uh, trivia, there are 108 stitches in a baseball, and that's the exact number of years that they did not win the championship. And the gentleman, number 44, Anthony Rizzo, I was one of the people, but I did the analytic uh, analysis to do a strong recommendation for him to come onto the team. So it was a, a huge uh, team effort. The moment that the ball touched his glove, they won the World Series. And uh, talking about uh, Wallenberg, one of the things that I really uh, hope everyone takes away is not just your current job, but how can you improve the world? And AI for good and data for good is one of the things I take personally. Um, so on the bottom right is one thing that w one of my friends was uh, imprisoned for a crime he did not commit, wrongfully imprisoned and using data and information and a lot of work, we eventually got him, he was a life in prison without parole, but we got him out of prison and he's free. So that's you know, one good thing, nothing else in life that um, I could be proud of. And then merging onto technology, uh, at one point I was the president of the Worldwide Oracle User Group at the time that they acquired Java and SQL, MySQL, PeopleSoft, so we saw this revolution from like no data to Oracle doing the databases, and we'll be talking about data warehousing, data lakes, and then this new paradigm of the lake house. And we also saw revolutions in mobile technology. Um, so let me step back towards Raoul Wallenberg. I think most people raised their hand, but there are some people I talked about uh, that hadn't heard of him, but briefly, wonderful humanitarian from Stockholm, from the uh, famous Wallenberg family, that during World War II uh, 
had this humanitarian mission where he rescued in various dramatical ways uh, directly 10,000 Hungarian Jewish civilians um, from the Holocaust and indirectly another 80,000 by stopping this massacre of the Budapest ghetto. Um, could, could, uh, yeah, I encourage you, if you haven't heard the story, to please look it up. Um, but uh, very daring parts, but the, the tragedy is he was arrested by the Soviets in Budapest after the war ended and he disappeared. So it's been one of the biggest mysteries of the last century of what happened to him. So it's very important to commemorate what he did historically, but it's also extremely important for the whole world, especially for Sweden, um, to help r really understand and unravel what precisely were the circumstances of his fate. Um, so I, I've been part of this uh, uh, investigation uh, for many decades to have hands-on experience to go into the Soviet, now Russian, gulag prison system, use data science and analytics to enter information, all of the interrogations, eyewitness accounts, transportation studies, to see what happened. Long story short, he was arrested, sent to different prisons for two, for two years, and then claims that he died, but there have been significant eyewitness accounts uh, that he was held in a prison called Vladimir, where all of the uh, international prisoners were kept. So many, many credible eyewitness accounts of dates, uh, including some of the staff there, the people that would serve food. So the goal was to take these card systems and hundreds of thousands of them and enter all the cells of where people were. Um, so you can see on the left the actual records and then make a database. And then you can use artificial intelligence and just general analytics to see what every single day of every floor of every cell of the prison and who was there and who wasn't. So were these eyewitness accounts credible or was there some conflicting, like another mistaken identity? So th that's what we've done. The investigation was fairly successful. There, uh, prisoner number seven was a very likely outcome where he, he could have been given a 25-year prison sentence in Vladimir and uh, then uh, possibly died. If you go to the Army Museum here, they have a box with his belongings that were given back to the family. But long story short, uh, the first, the only empirical evidence-based investigation into that fate. Um, and you can see the card system of what it looked like. For more information, ralsfate.org, as well as the RWI, the Raoul Wallenberg Institute, are great ways to keep up with what happened. Um, so that, that's like one, one data journey, using information to find what happened to an extremely important case. The next is uh, the movie Moneyball. I'll, I'll do a show of hands. Has anyone heard of that movie or seen it? Wow, a lot of people. I'm, it was actually on the plane, a uh, long flight over as I, as I came over, but uh, it's basically uh, an aspect of one of the stories of my life. I'm extremely pleased to have worked with Major League Baseball organizations for many decades. And when I started, I was a fan and I realized, just like you might see in your industry, things that were uh, overvalued or undervalued didn't quite make sense. Some very good players would have bad statistics and vice versa. So I just, I was a teenager, woke up and came up with this idea, if you see the letter X in statistics, uh, like expected goals now in European football or expected wins, that was just this paradigm that I, I thought of that made sense. It's a team sport, so sometimes what your value is, is really a factor of how your teammates have performed. So the slogan, adapt or die, it's kind of an interesting one. And you know, it's also applicable every single industry with artificial intelligence. Um, you don't want to innovate or adapt just for the sake of adapting. But in many cases, if you're not changing, your competition is the way people are consuming is changing extremely rapidly. And a year or two or four years from now, things are going to be extremely different as well. So for me personally, I like to change up what I'm doing every single year 
and especially in sports, if you don't change every four years, you become less and less relevant. And the nice thing is, after the movie Moneyball came out, it inspired a whole generation. In fact, there's now college courses all around the world on sports analytics and sports business. So wild to see when I started, there were only four people employed by a sports organization to now see it a, a entire multi-thousand person industry. And you may not be able to read those actual numbers, but this shows that analytics absolutely changed every single sport. And those lines going up are an indication of strikeouts in the game. Uh, higher than ever before in history. Something called shifting, where you use only data to position where a player might be standing to anticipate a ball being hit to them. Um, doesn't cost you any more money, but when we first started doing this with the Cubs, only 3% of all balls in play use this information to defensively position. Only 3%. And as of last year, it went up to more than half of all balls in play, since the data showed it was extremely helpful. In some cases, you had an 80, 80% 80 better chance of making an out than without the information. And it would win about eight to nine more games per year, which is roughly 80 to million more dollars for a team per year, and the difference of making the playoffs or not, just from using information and nothing else. And then the bottom left is another sport, basketball totally changed the game. The NBA went from mostly two-point shot attempts to mostly now three-point shot attempts. Completely game-changing. And how, how is this achieved? You know, how, there's an explosion of data throughout every industry, and especially in sports. Uh, now that you can incorporate uh, vi video, you can do things like automatically tag, just from a video, different body parts and see how that moves in three-dimensional space. Then you can take, one of my favorite parts of the data science process is feature engineering. You could take information and say, this is an arm, but the sequence of movements is somebody running across the field, they're kicking with their left foot, and then I had this wonderful conversation before about OKRs and how do you measure people's success at a company on a business perspective. And it's not just an individual contribution with OKRs, it's really a team contribution. Same thing in sports. It's not just scoring a goal, but what are the sequences that lead up to a goal? And also in like, for example, retail or sales. It's not just you made a sale, yes or no, but what is that sequence of events that led up to that sale? So in sports, it's fascinating. You can do feature engineering, like in financial analysis. It's not just the price or the earning, but you can come up with a new feature, price per earning, that could be even more predictive than those two fields individually. So you can get very creative and eventually win. Now, in addition to, to Major League Baseball, got some visibility, so I ended up working in lots of sports. And last year, I had a, a very fun job traveling around the world with McLaren and Formula One Racing, helping out with their race strategy team to figure out all sorts of use cases. When will it rain to a five-minute increment? What will the track temperature be or the air temperature be? Uh, better predictions than what the weather station could do. Uh, using high high-definition, high-speed cameras to see if there's debris on your tire or your opponent's tire. And that's all streaming data, real-time, 80,000 car parts, um, uh, 300 sensors on a car, sending information 1,000 times a second, and figuring out actionable insights uh, from that in real-time. So uh, in addition to numbers, one of the things that Moneyball taught me and working with McLaren and other teams have taught me is that there are humans behind everything. Uh, from an engineering standpoint, yes, mathematics can help you aerodynamically help a car, but in the end, it's athletes. And by putting yourself in their shoes, you could see as you go around a turn, your head's twisting and it's changing your perspective. And that would trigger an idea, and I would then work with some of the drivers uh, Daniel Ricardo, Lando Norris, to help with the training exercises with their physical trainer. So all of that is to get into the seat 
of, in your case, your customer, your partner, the users of your, whatever you're selling or producing, and get it from their perspective, since it's humans that are actually making the actions in most cases. And going from there, well, you know, let's kind of start transitioning towards the lake house. And through every industry, it's, it used to be data warehousing, where it's numerical-based insights. And now there's a wealth of new types of data, typically video, uh, geospatial, text information. Uh, we talked about large language models, time series, and visual information. So about 85% of the data out there, some might be even more, is this unstructured data. And almost all of it is unused. So this is a, a big challenge for companies. They, they're collecting and storing data, and it's just kind of sitting there unused, or maybe they're just looking at it a historical perspective. So one of the trends we're seeing is gleaning information from all of this. And multimodal is being able to make the best predictions using both structured and unstructured data. So there will be winners in every single industry, those that are able to extract the most insightful and actionable insights from all of their data. Everyone wants to now, in the last couple of months, start leveraging all of their data. It, it's incredible time to be part of this. Um, and this conference has been wonderful in the education. Uh, but a lot of companies are struggling. There's two very different paradigms of information out there. Your structured historical data in data warehousing, and then your machine learning unstructured data in your data lakes. Um, uh, com companies want to go along this maturity curve from uh, old reporting information to being predictive to actually being actionable, to automatically, in some cases, taking action when certain events happen. And it's unnecessarily complex. You typically need about six different vendors, multiple different platforms, leads to a lot of challenges. Like if you're just doing a predictive analytics on both video and information, it's very hard to do unless you have one unified platform. Also, the governance and security. If you have two, three, four different ways of security, understanding the lineage of the data from its raw form all the way through the structured form to the ETL process to the machine learning, um, uh, you really should not have more than one governance. So this data lake house is the new paradigm. And uh, every company uh, it will be having one form of data lake house. And so it only makes sense to have both your structured, unstructured, backward-looking, forward-looking information all in one place. And another theme is collaboration. The teamwork of Major League Baseball, the teamwork of sports, everyone's pulling in the same direction. And then the same paradigm, everyone in your company, from technologists to data engineers to data analysts to non-technical people, the business people, all need to be part of the same collaboration. So having one in the same platform with the same common definitions, the same standards, only makes sense to have that in Unified. And the foundation is on the cloud as well, cloud and on-premise. But for the cloud, companies now are becoming so complex that multi-cloud is, is part of it. And uh, you know, just a, a quick second about Databricks, a uh, company I'm at. Encourage you to go to the, the booth to learn more or come to our website. But been fascinating to be part of this journey. We are heavy on the open source. Our founders, actually our uh, co-founder, Ali, was uh, raised and grew up in, in Sweden, in Stockholm himself, or Uppsala. Um, so we have that Swedish connection. Um, 5,000 employees and um, a, a large foundation on open source. One of the things that was fascinating is just how prevalent this open source is. Uh, uh, 43 million downloads of Spark and MLflow on, on, and Delta Lake. So I have less than a minute left. Let me jump forward. A lot of great use cases. Uh, just to kind of leave, uh, go to our website if you're interested, especially we came out something called Dolly, which is a large language model, all on open source, freely available, um, 
you know, go. We have notebooks you can learn and share. Um, we also have data and AI summit virtual or in person where you can learn all about that. And I wanted to uh, thank you all for those three different acts. Hopefully one of the three, two of the three, but really hopefully all three of them were of interest to you. I'll be hanging around the booth. Please connect with me on LinkedIn if you'd like to continue following or you want to reach out to me personally. And again, I hope you all have great success in all of your journeys. And thank you very much.